This vignette from the Gospel of John is perhaps the most complex and also perhaps the most humorous of the stories that John presents in his introduction to Jesus. All of the Gospels record stories about the healing of individuals who were blind, but as John presents it, we learn a great deal about blindness and the ability to see. It all starts with Jesus walking along the road, and his disciples happen to see a blind man sitting on the side of the road and ask, Jesus, whose fault was it that this man is blind? Was it his fault or was it his parents' fault? Now, you have to realize that the disciples grew up in a culture that believed that illness came as a punishment from God. And I hate to say it, but we, none of us, are very far from that concept have you ever said to yourself, I wonder what I did to catch that cold? As though somehow you went looking for the virus. <laughs> you know, the one that was on the doorknob or that person who sneezed to you while you were in the doctor's office for some other reason. Uh, we always have this kind of response that somehow we're responsible for getting sick. And then, Yet we have to realize that in Jesus' day, this has a, a much stronger theological implication. But Jesus carries it farther than just that question by saying that the man was born blind to help reveal the workings of God. It happened so that Jesus might reveal himself as the light of the world. And immediately we know that the story is going to be much more complicated than just being a witness to another miraculous healing. Jesus spits on the ground, creates a, a muddy solution that he applies to the man's eyes. And then he tells the man to go wash his face in the pool at Siloam. And after so doing so, the man can suddenly see. A man born blind at birth can suddenly see. And when he goes to his town where he's grown up, he runs into his neighbors, and it's interesting, John explains that the neighbors begin to argue over whether this is really the blind man. What? He's been sitting there for all these years, and now you're worried about whether it's the right guy? Well, he's not blind anymore. Isn't he the blind guy? And so we hear John introducing this kind of comedic moment in the midst of this healing a very serious healing. And apparently once they're pretty sure that this is the right guy, their next question is, how did you get healed? And he explains how he was healed. And he tells them that Jesus made that mud and put it on his eyes and he had to go wash his face. And then the next question is, well, where is this Jesus? And you have to remember, this guy just got finished washing his face. He's blind and now he can see, but he hasn't even seen Jesus. He's only spoken to him. How does he know where Jesus is? Well, if they'd been listening, they would have discovered that he was the blind guy. <laughs> How would he know? Am I my Jesus keeper? No. Well, they're, they're so upset with this whole thing that instead of rejoicing with the fact that he can see, they drag him off to the synagogue and present him to the Pharisees who were there because Jesus has healed this man on the Sabbath. <gasps> Golly, he's made somebody see, and it's Saturday. What a terrible day to do that to him. And it's interesting that the Pharisees get the response, and they're divided. Some believe that Jesus is a heretic because he's gone ahead and, and broken the Sabbath. Others are worried about his ability to heal because he probably is a sinner, and you know that sinners shouldn't be out healing anybody. So, in a sense, they put the blind, the man who at least was blind, on trial. They ask him questions. They say, what do you think has gone on? They're grilling him. I wondered if they had a little spotlight on him. Kind of one of those noir movies. And, and he's sitting there. They jump to the, to the fact that they don't know or they want him to answer the question. And he says, well, you know, I think maybe Jesus might be a prophet. <gasps> How can he be a prophet? This can't be possible. You must be wrong. So what do they do? 
They do what we all do. They go find other witnesses, his parents. Parents, be ready to be dragged before somebody for your kids. Right? They bring his parents in, and, and the first question is, is this your son? Well, let me see his ID. Of course he's our son. How come he can see? I didn't know he could see. He's been blind since birth. Well, you explain to it. And it's interesting, the parents kind of waffle. Yeah, that's their son, but they are a little nervous about the fact that the Pharisees are asking about his ability to see, and so they cop a plea. He's old enough. Go ask him. Clearly, this is not the, what they expected. So it's interesting, what do they do? They drag the guy who's been healed back into court. And they give him a second going over. You know that Jesus is a sinner. And clearly the blind man is fed up with the whole deal. With this kind of treatment, he doesn't need it. And he turns and says, listen, all I know is that I started out this morning blind. This guy came along, he put mud on my eyes, and now I see. What more do you want me to say? Why do you want to hear it over again? I mean, kind of a testy blind man. You know. What do you want to know? Are you interested in becoming one of his disciples, maybe? Is that what this is all about? Oh, boy. Wrong thing to say. Oh. It's interesting. In response, the blind man, in responding to these questions, really develops a very strong statement, a theological statement, about what he's witnessed. Here's an astounding thing. You don't know where he comes from, but he made me see. You know that God doesn't listen to sinners, yet he opened my eyes. I have never heard of anyone taking someone who's been blind from birth and making them see. If this guy isn't from God, he wouldn't be able to do those kind of things. And it's interesting, in response to that incredible theological statement, the Pharisees say, you were born entirely in sin, and you're trying to teach us. And they throw him out of the building. Hmm. You see, the Pharisees actually figured that they were saying the right stuff because they were right where the disciples were. Sin was the thing that caused illness. Obviously, this man must have been a sinner. Blindness and sin are connected. So Jesus hears about this guy being thrown out of the synagogue and finds the man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy says, well, who is the Son of Man? Tell me, and I'll believe in him. And so Jesus reveals, I am the one. I am the one who is speaking to you right now. And the man says, Lord, I believe. His proclamation of faith. And then Jesus says, those who do see may become blind, and those who do not see may see. And it's some Pharisees who hear him say that, and they say, surely we are not blind. To which Jesus responds, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say you see, your sin condemns you. Wow. Here's a whole discussion of blindness and sight, of seeing and believing, of being blind to what the eyes can see and being open to what the heart can know. John is saying that sometimes being blind allows someone to see much more clearly than those who can see who have vision and fail to see. Back when I was in fifth grade, my teacher noticed that I was doing good desk work, but I was lousy at the stuff that was up on the blackboard. I could get by a lot of tests, but when the classroom suddenly was working on that board up in the front of the room, and you have to remember my name is Wales, so I'm always seated at the back row. Well, when the class was up there doing stuff on the board, I kind of looked out the window and daydreamed. Which didn't get me good grades for attendance in class. 
And finally, my teacher was the one who recommended to my mother that I have my eyes tested. And I remember going to the optometrist and him doing the little test, A or B, A, B, C, B, and we did all that. And then the next week I went back and I got my glasses. And I can remember this very moment, what it was like to walk out of the door of the optometrist's office and look across the parking lot by the library and discovering that trees had leaves <laughs> that you could see. Up until that moment in my life, trees were always these large pom-poms that went back and forth in the wind as one clump. And I always wondered how the leaves fell, if they could all be one clump when they were there. And then all of a sudden, I also discovered what my le little league coach was telling me when he used to say, watch the stitching on the ball. As far as I can, was concerned, when I was at bat, the pitcher would move, and then somewhere about three feet in front of me, the ball would appear. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd sit there and go, stitching? What are you talking about? Stitching. And all of a sudden, when I was standing for the first time at bat, hey, you know, you can actually see the ball sewing stuff on it. Oh, that's what he was talking about. Suddenly discovering what sight is gives you an idea of what goes on. And I realized that I had to be healed even though it was with these so that I could really see. And it was the same thing, the same truth that the Pharisees failed to understand. They thought, like I did, that they could see. And anything that challenged that understanding had to be wrong. But, but here was this eyewitness, this blind man, who discovered sight, both physical and spiritual sight. And the truth of who Jesus really was became clear as day to him. He could see the stitches. He could see what was in front of him. And the blindness that the man suffered from had nothing to do with sin. It had nothing to do with sin. But the blindness that the Pharisees suffered from, that blindness had everything to do with sin. John's message is clear. As Jesus would often say during his ministry, if you have eyes to see, see and follow me into the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Almighty, all-powerful God, you guide us every step of the way, and yet it's amazing how hard it is for us to see even when we know what we should see. It's like we've left our glasses behind somewhere and failed to take them with us as we continue to travel through this Lenten season. Help us to see. Amen.